Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. We now turn in your hymnals to page 256, 257. As your textbook likes to do, it will often juxtapose or bring together two titles. Here we'll be looking first at the O. Henry text, Gift of Magi, and then we'll turn to the Saki classic, the interlopers. Now, um, before we get to uh, the gift of Magi, I just want to pay attention really quickly on page 257. Now, um, earlier we worked with uh, a couple of titles in uh, Most Dangerous Game and American History, and we focused on the idea of plot and conflict. Of course, in any great story, we're going to see elements that we'll be seeing repeated in a lot of these titles. For us at 2B, and you want to write this down right now as we're getting ready to do this analysis, literary analysis topic here for us is irony. Now let's remind ourselves that irony, first and foremost, write it down, a contradiction, right? Something doesn't fit. A contradiction between what? Appearance. And the way we think things are going to happen, and reality, the way things actually happen. In other words, it's the difference between what is expected and what actually happens. Now, we have uh, uh, different kinds of irony, and we will be focusing in these titles on what we call situational irony. You want to write this down on 257. Something happens in the story that contradicts the expectations of a character or of you, the reader. For example, a runner who trains hard would be expected to do well in a race. It would be ironic if she trained so hard that she overslept and missed the race. Okay? The other thing we want to write down is surprise ending. Often a surprise ending will present situational irony. The turn of events may be startling, but writers using irony usually build clues into the story that make the ending logical just the same. Ironies and surprise endings usually help convey the story's theme or message. Uh, it, it, we like to say it this way often, so let's put this in our notes at 2B. When we are looking at literary techniques like irony, we have two uh, questions that we like to ask and answer. The first one is, what is it? That is to say, an example of situational irony. And the second question is, how does it work? In other words, okay, so there's an example of situational irony in the surprise ending, but how does it work? That has to do with everything usually related to 2A, messages and themes. In other words, how does the event at the end, a situational piece of situational irony and a surprise ending, how does that have anything to do with the surprise ending at the end of the story, okay? We also at uh, Reading Skills are going to be worried, uh, thinking about making inferences. Take a look at that one really quickly. Inference is a logical assumption that you make based on details of a text. The author may state some information directly, but most of the ideas in a story are suggested through details. When reading short stories, use your own prior knowledge and experience to make inferences. Well, of course, we understand that in 303 as simply defining what we mean by learning, the capacity, again, to connect new information to old information, right? So that one for us is obviously very important. All right, let's turn now to our first of these two stories, The Gift of the Magi, and I'm on page 258. Notice we've got our important question for Unit 2, is conflict necessary? Obviously, the vocabulary for us is something, again, we're always concentrating on. I want to point out these word studies on page 258 and elsewhere that will give you some kind of often Latin or Greek understandings of etymologies, where words come from, prefixes, and the like. All of that for us is significant in our study. Let's turn now to the actual author itself, O. Henry. Now, if O. Henry uh, already strikes a bell for you, it's because when you turn back quickly to page 213, I recommend you do this for just a second, when you turn back to page 213 and we were introducing you to the Richard Connell text, The Most Dangerous Game, look down there in the bottom left corner. Do you see where it says, Did You Know? When The Most Dangerous Game was first published, it won the prestigious, there it is, O. Henry Memorial Award for short fiction. O. Henry Memorial Award? What is that about? Well, let's, let's learn about O. Henry. Notice your dates, 1862 to 1910. Let's read about it. William Sidney Porter, better known as O. Henry, dropped out of school at 16. So for people that tell you, you know, you're a failure if you drop out of school, O. Henry is a classic example. Now, obviously, you can see the dates. It's a different time uh, living in the world than it is today, which is why we, all, we always argue, dude, you need your education. 
1882, he left his home in North Carolina to seek his fortune in Texas. He worked on a ranch, then at a bank, and eventually started writing sketches. So let's put it in our notes this way. Many of the writers that we studied not only had their education through schooling, but their education through travel and work. And that, uh, uh, of course, will inform much of what it is that they do in their actual story and poetry writing. He became a reporter, columnist, and cartoonist for the Houston Post. Let's also say that many of the people we read came out of the field of journalism. They were either writing ads, they were writing news stories, they were sometimes writing cartoons. We think of, the, of, the, of uh, Thurber as an example of that, right? In 1896, Porter was jailed for his involvement in a bank scandal, so he even spent time in, in prison. While in prison, he began writing stories. When he was released, Porter changed his name to O. Henry, moved to New York City, and developed into one of America's most celebrated writers of short fiction. And then, just to further what we were saying a few seconds ago about Most Dangerous Game in the bottom there at 259 on the left, since 1919, the O'Henry Awards for short fiction have been given to the best short stories written each year. I would recommend, and put it in your notes to do so, I recommend that you Google very easily, you can do this, the O'Henry Awards and start looking at who it was that won those awards and then just start scanning down through that list to see all the names of people. Like we said, Connell will be there for Most Dangerous Game. Now, the title of our text here is The Gift of the Magi. Let's read the background for the story. In a story, written years ago, prices may seem unrealistically low. The reason is inflation, the steady increase in the prices of most things over time. In this story, written around 1905, $32 is roughly one month's rent for Dell and Jim. For most people today, $32 would not even cover one week's rent, right? Okay, or some, some of you would say, well, 32 bucks wouldn't even cover a good meal, right? Okay, so in other words, times have changed. Now, this is an interesting story for us because it specifically is going to treat the ideas that are conveyed through its title, the gift of the Magi. Now, let's put this in our notes at, two, uh, at 3A really quickly because if you don't know this story, this story isn't going to have much meaning for you. In Christmas time, you sometimes will see those little kinds of uh, um, maybe like figurines and stuff like that where there's like a little manger and then there's like, you know, some animals and that kind of thing. But then sometimes on those figurines, around those figurines, you'll see three wise men. Sometimes the reference is kind of like looking like, you know, kings or something like that. They got turbans on it. And then they got gifts in their hands. Now, what's up with that? Well, of course, the story of the gift of the Magi is that during the time when Jesus Christ is born, there's a, a, a very obscure story about some men that show up from the east. They've traveled looking at some star which somehow has stopped over Bethlehem and they've decided that this is an important town and they go in and they find the baby Jesus in a manger and then they give the baby Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, put this at 3A. In your senior year, we're going to do another text that references this story by T.S. Eliot, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and in that one, we're going to have uh, as well this notion of the Magi, the journey of the Magi, okay? So you'll, you'll want to make a comment in your notes that this story about the Magi comes up several times in literature. However, here, it's going to be kind of ironic. So when we finish our story together, one of the questions we're going to ask is, why is the title of the story the gift of the Magi? Okay, number two. Many of my freshmen will say, even though we study Romeo and Juliet, that greatest Shakespeare play of love, supposedly, many of my students will say that this is the greatest love story they've ever read. Okay, I'm going to ask you at the end of this story, why? So here we go. Let's go ahead and turn the page now. The Gift of the Magi. By the way, do you see it at the top of 261? This is the first time that you've seen this at the top of 261 on the right, where it says exemplar text. Do you see that? What that means is your textbook company has decided that what you're studying right here is one of the most important texts. So we want to sit up, obviously, and pay close attention. All right, here we go. The story, The Gift of the Magi, I challenge you again. Conquer Monkey Mind, just read along. It was all in 60s. The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. $1.87. That was all. And 60 cents in it was in pennies. 
Penny saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheek burned with the silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Della counted it, one dollar and eighty-seven cents. And the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl. So Della did it. Which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles, with sniffles predominating. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at $8 per week. It did not exactly beggar description, but it certainly had that word on the lookout for the mendicancy squad. In the vestibule below was a letter box into which no letter would go, and an electric button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity when its possessor was being paid $30 per week. Now, when the income was shrunk to $20, the letters of Dillingham looked blurred as though they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della, which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with the powder rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only one dollar and eighty-seven cents with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months with this result. Twenty dollars a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy a present for Jim, her Jim. Many a happy hour she had spent planning for something nice for him, something fine and rare and sterling, something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. There was a pier glass between the windows of the room. Perhaps you have seen a pier glass in an eight-dollar flat. A very thin and very agile person may, by observing his reflection in a rapid sequence of longitudinal strips, obtain a fairly accurate conception of his looks. Della, being slender, had mastered the art. Suddenly she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Rapidly she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window some day to dry, just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor, with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed, just to see him pluck out his beard from envy. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her, rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee and made itself almost a garment for her. And then she did it up again nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute, and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. On went her old brown jacket, on went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with the brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Sophronie, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran and collected herself, panting. Madame, large, too white, chilly, hardly looked the sophronie. Will you buy my hair, asked Della? 
I buy hair, said Madame. Take your hat off and let's have a sight at the looks of it. Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said Madame, lifting the mass of the practiced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings. Forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by meretricious ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him. The quietness and value. The description applied to both. Twenty-one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly, on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of a chain. When Della reached home, her intoxication gave way a little to prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love, which is always a tremendous task, dear friends, a mammoth task. Within 40 minutes, her head was covered with tiny, close-lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and 87 cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat on the corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his step on the stair, away down on the first flight, and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit of saying little silent prayers about the simplest everyday things. And now she whispered, Please, God, make him think I am still pretty. The door opened, and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow, he was only 22, and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat, and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door, as immovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed upon Della and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly with that peculiar expression on his face. Della wriggled off the table and went to him. Jim, darling, she cried, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold it because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you. You've cut off your hair? asked Jim laboriously as if he had not arrived at that patent fact yet, even after the hardest mental labor. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me just as well anyhow? I'm me without my hair, ain't I? Jim looked about the room curiously. You say your hair is gone, he said, with an air almost of idiocy. You needn't look for it, said Della. It's sold, I tell you sold and gone too it's christmas eve boy be good to me for it went for you maybe the 
hairs of my head were numbered, she went on with a sudden serious sweetness. But nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the chops on, Jim? Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. He enfolded his Della. For ten seconds, let us regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other direction. Eight dollars a week or a million a year? What is the difference? A mathematician or a wit would give you the wrong answer. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. This dark assertion will be illuminated later on. Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table. Don't make any mistake, Dell, he said, about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going a while at first. White fingers and nimble tore at the string and paper, and then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then, alas, a quick feminine change to hysterical tears and wails, necessitating the immediate employment of all the comforting powers of the Lord of the Flat. For there lay the combs, the set of combs side and back that Della had worshipped for long in a Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in the beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now they were hers, but the tresses that should have adorned the coveted adornments were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and a smile and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim. And then Della leaped up like a little singed